Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Okay, we're in the far turn. Uh, Peter, recovered alcoholic. Um, a handful of years ago, uh, my sponsor called me up. He used to call me up at about 6 a.m., and I think he I always suspected he had just finished uh, a meditation because he would call me up still but jacked up. And uh, I'd throw questions and considerations and, and things at me, and and so um, I learned to just get a notepad and pen and let him go and then ask questions. And uh, he called me up one time. He says he used to call me money. I never had any, but he said, money, what's going on? And um, – I said, good morning. And uh, in fact, one time he says, how are you doing? I, he, Money, how are you doing? I says, uh, I'm hanging in there. And he read me the riot act at 6 o'clock in the morning. saying, I'm hanging in there. But uh, he says, uh, what are you doing about the dash? And I didn't know what he meant. I said, the dash, what's now where are we going again? Uh, he says, what are you about, Money, what are you doing about the dash? And I said, I don't know what the dash means. He says, you go to a tombstone, you go to a graveyard, go look at the tombstone. You got the day you were born, the day you went home to God, that little two-inch dash of your life. What are you doing about the dash? What are you doing about your life? And it made me swallow hard. I mean, my life was full. My life was great. But um, was I was I doing what I wanted to do with my life? Um, was I happy in all I was doing? Um, was I missing little moments that were going by? And it just made me stop for a moment. And uh, that has been something that little silly little question has stayed with me uh, ever since. Uh, and I work very uh, uh, a lot. I, I try not to miss the little things. Um, there's a great song. Uh, I think it's I think it's Carol King. A uh, great line of song that said the line is These are the good old days. Uh, these are the good old days. So uh, when I play with my grandson, um, that's going to be something I say, well, it's a good old day, but it's happening right now. And uh, I can get so caught up in later on when I, get, when I get there, I'll be really good. And when I get there, I'll be really good. And what about now? You know, because later on is a bunch of nows strung together. So, um, Working with others... Um, and Chris was talking about a 12-step call. Um, there's a couple of things I'm just going to hit and get us out of here. But um, in a vision for you, my favorite chapter in the book, um, there is Bill and Bob paying a call on Bill Dotson. And it's my favorite 12-step call. It's probably the best one ever done. Um, it's seamless. And uh, they're clear cut, uh, clear cut, precise, exact, and specific. And they had a method at which they were going to operate. And uh, the story and the vision for you is um, they go to see this 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 lawyer who's uh, blown up a few times and a violent drunk um, with the nurses. And Bill and Bob pay a visit on him. <coughs> And they sit with this guy, and a lot of you guys know this story, but it's really behind the obvious what's going on here. And he goes from a, 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 a ward down to a hospital room, and which meant that he really bought the farm this time. And he's sitting in this room saying, you know, why am I in this private room? What did I do this time? Probably thinking how, many, how much I got to live here. And so he's quite shaky, and Bill and Bob walk in. And one thing... You know, I always respected AA, uh, I try to show my respect to AA, is if I'm going to go make a 12-step call, if I have the opportunity to look like a recovered member, I will. I don't get dressed like I'm going to go commit a felony when I'm done. So I could picture Bill and Bob. I know it was the year addressed. And uh, when we do a talk from the podium or, or we're going to go visit a family of an alcoholic, we don't get dressed like we're going to go to the gym as soon as we're done or we're going to go commit a felony or we just got out of jail. We suit up and show up because we may be the only copy of the book someone reads. So let's be the best example of it. So I can imagine Bill and Bob walking in, you know, and um, there's this guy lying in the bed like, 
who are you guys? What, what are you doing here? What do I do now? Um, and they tell him, I love the line that says, we're giving you treatment for alcoholism. So they don't ask the guy, do you think you're an alcoholic? This is why we're here. We know you got it. So let's stop BSing each other. This is why we're here. And then what the book says in a vision for you is that Bill and Bob take an hour reach to tell this drunk their story. And he says, that's me. That's me. I drink like that. They, they bait the drunk. They got the drunk identification. One drunk work with another. So now we're on the same playing field, even playing field. You're like me. I'm like you. Right? You screwed up too, just as bad as I did. But you're on that side of the bed looking pretty good, and I'm strapped down. What's, what's the deal? And then they go on to tell him about the mind stuff. Right? Then they go on to talk about the body, how the alcohol deteriorates the body. They're probably talking about phenomenon of craving, mental obsession. And what do they do while a guy's laying in a hospital bed? They tell him about the spiritual answer they found. They tell him how to get it. They didn't say, oh, he still knew. Let him get 90 days first. Imagine telling this drunk in 1930, whatever, that, uh, listen, you have to make 90 meetings in 90 days. There weren't even 90 meetings in, to make in 90 days. That's why that 90 meetings in 90 days drives me nuts. Um, <laughs> so you tell them about the spiritual answer they found, right? The guy's lying in this hospital bed. He thinks it over, he leaves the hospital three days later, never drank again. They tell him their story. This is what you're up against. This is the solution. Now, when you read um, um, uh, uh, Bill Dotson's story, he hears, he tells his angle, and he hears Bill and Bob kind of chit-chatting to each other, saying to each other, you think he's worth saving. Contemporary A Politically correct AA would be really upset with that because you can't upset an alcoholic. Have to be touchy feely with all of us. Huh? I love you, you love me. No, I love you more. No, I love you more. Right? <laughs> Keep coming back. It works. It works. So work it. You work it. You're worth it. And all. You ever hear that routine at the end of a meeting? It's like Bonnie and Friends. It's re, it's. Re, you know. So what do they do? They um, um, huh. now I got to write inventory tonight. What are they? Doing? <laughs> Jesus Lord, right. we love you. Um, so so they go and they sit with this drunk and they they do these things and uh, they're saying, does he want it? You think oh, we're wasting time because there's someone else to go. I'm sure we can go find. We're not going to waste your time. I'm not going to waste our time. You're either in or you're out. What do you, what do you want to do? But they also knew that working with drunks was vital to their recovery. Like when I got here in 1988 and people came to get me, it wasn't because I was a nice guy. It's a new drunk. Go get him. Because part of what we do, part of my recovery, is it, it, it was working with others. It's vital. Life-giving when I do and threatening when I don't. It's vital. I need to go work with stuff. When I'm home um, around family, I, I mean, I, I'll tell, I, need, I need a drunk. I need to go be around drunks. I need to go work with a drunk. I just want to get in there and work with a drunk, be it something like this. Right. It's vital to what we do, sitting down at a table and w walking someone through, you know. And passing on what was given to me. So that's what they did. Now, so it's the best 12 step call. If you don't know it, read it. Take a look at it in the vision for you. It's, it's a tremendous thing. And the neat thing is, three days later, this guy leaves and uh, never drank again. How cool is that? Um, it made a life for himself. What we can do, I, I was one of them when I was new, one of, one of those folks who would uh, uh, lock themselves into uh, a drunk and uh, their success was my success and their failure was my failure, right? And that prospect had to shine from the podium because it's my prospect and I look good now, right? And if they didn't give a good talk, I'd run out of the room. You know, we all go through that at the beginning. But what we can do is get so locked in to a drunk who doesn't want it, we can't hear 
the other one banging on a door. And I've been asked this question for many folks over the years. I have this man, I have this woman, I'm working with them, and I keep chasing down. They don't want to keep getting drunk, and they don't return the phone calls. And my deal is, like, because I identify with that, why are you still working with them? Why are you enabling that type of behavior? Where's the consequence for their behavior? Let them bop the legs up. They may have to drink again. Oh, I can't allow that. Why not? You don't want it, but sometimes that has to happen. You just get ready. You just be ready when the phone rings. Page 96 sums this up beautifully. It says, don't be discouraged if a prospect does not respond at once. Search out an alcoholic, uh, another alcoholic, and try again. You're sure to find someone desperate enough to accept with eagerness what you offer. We find it a waste of time. Our book is not, I, I love this book because it's right to the point. They don't worry about, you know, our feelings in this book. How could you say it's a waste of time? They just said it's a waste of time. Simple. It's a waste of time. The person's not a waste. The person's not, the person is discounted. The time is of the essence. So I'm trying to work on you and you don't want it. And he's banging on my door, but I'm so focused in on you because my ego is all involved in this. Right? It says we find it a waste of time to keep chasing a man or woman who cannot, uh, will not work with you. Um, I have found that my way of working with folks uh, may be the, the, a wrong delivery for someone. But they'll come to me for a while, kind of hold on, catch their breath, and I've been made small enough to know that I may just be a buoy in the ocean before they get to you. That's okay. I've had lots of folks start with me and say, just back away, and um, I, you know, I check up on them, and then I walk them to me, and they have another big book guy that they're working with, and they're okay. Okay, that's good. So God just used me as a little, one of the dots to get connected before they found where they had to go to. And I'm ready for that as well. Okay? It says, um, if you leave such a person alone, he uh, may soon be convinced that they cannot recover by themselves. To spend too much time on any one situation is to deny some other alcoholic an opportunity to live and be happy. One of our fellowship failed entirely with his first half dozen prospects. He often says that if he had continued to work on them, he might have deprived many others who have since recovered of their chance. That's pretty powerful stuff and very much to the point. Now, again, I want to reiterate, doesn't mean we give up. I don't give up on Joe. But I got Bill calling me or coming to the meeting constantly drunk looking for some direction, but I got to fix Joe. We'll go work with Bill for a while. Right. Another piece that is brought to me lots of times, I hear kicked around in AA, is the bottom of page 100. It says, assuming we are spiritually fit, we can do uh, all sorts of things alcoholics are not supposed to do. People have said we must not go where liquor is served, we must not have it in our homes, we must shun friends who drink, we must avoid moving pictures which show drinking scenes, uh, we must uh, not watch the Super Bowl or any sports game, don't go near the TV, don't even go outside, stay home, lock the doors. <laughs> um, <sighs> avoid people, places, and things. Um, so have AA come to your house and don't go out. We must not go into bars. We must have friends hide their bottles if we go to their houses. Could you imagine on Christmas, grandma and grandpa say, come on over, and there's 20 people. Everyone has to put away the liquor because I'm here. What an inconvenience you are, right? Um we mustn't think or be reminded about alcohol. Now, you see, if we live that way, we put our, the, I put the responsibility of my recovery on you. You can't talk about alcohol. If you're a civilian, you can't drink around me. You can't talk about the fun you had last night with the guys at the bar drinking. Uh, don't turn on the TV when the game's on because a beer commercial might come on. So I'm dumping all this on you because I'm on the edge about to go off. 
That's a horrible way to live. Talk about, you know, bondage of self. Um, it says our experience shows that this not, uh, that this is not necessarily so. Um, we meet these conditions every day. An al- alcoholic who cannot meet them still has an alcoholic mind. That's interesting. Main problem centers in the mind, not the body. So if I have all these little things that are setting me off, my book just told me I still have the mind of an alcoholic, which means what? I'm not recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Right? Now I got that thing, that, that, that trigger issue thing. I was at a meeting in Staten Island once and there's this one guy, loudmouth guy and, uh, don't drink, go to meetings kind of guy. Anyway, we were, uh, it was summertime, and it was a morning meeting. And I went down to the meeting, and he was um, he was standing up against the wall, and um, he gave himself the okay. Like this was an okayness in his recovery about how he sees uh, the, the guys drinking on the job where he works, and they have um, the sweat dripping off the cold bottles, and it just looks so good. And I remember one, and I think about it, but I get to these meetings, and he's still in that place. That, oh, my God, that drinking look, that looks so good, and that, there's that attraction, that thing going on, and he's fighting it off. And has to run to a meeting to talk about it. That's not freedom. That's not recovery. That's bondage. Right? Um, I've gone to weddings and, and, and business parties and um, uh, barbecues and Super Bowls and, and Super Bowl parties with civilians and, uh, and, and people like us and um, in the position of neutrality, safe and protected. Now, the 12 step call, if I'm not a position, in a position of uh, being safe in, 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 in a place of neutrality, and I'm not living the way this book says, how do I do a 12 step call on a drunk who's drinking? And maybe mixing it with some dry goods. How do I do that? How do I go with one or two other drunks to get Joe? And we kick the door open, and there's Joe, and he's got the liquor out, he's got some powdered stuff out, or whatever he might be doing, and I'm still in a place of issues and triggers because I'm not spiritually fit, and I still have the mind of an alcoholic. You know what? Then you're 12-stepping me and Joe. Because I'm going to look at it and go, wow, I remember. (laughs) Almost, and I've heard this. I, I remember a woman telling me this in AA. She actually admired, um, not admired, she used another word, like there was a part of her that wished she was kind of back there again. What? Right? So now we're looking at it and, and romanticizing and having euphoric recall about, wow, I remember how nice it was, what it did for me, never to me. And I'm looking at it and the dry goods, oh, I'm supposed to be there on a mission from God and I'm, I'm, look where I'm at. How do I do a 12-step call? Not too good. I'm supposed to be going there spiritually fit with spiritual wings, get him or her out to a detox and wait for them to get out and see if they want me to sponsor them. And I've been able to get that stuff and toss it, get rid of it. Can't do that with an alcoholic mind. 12-step call working with those. This is vital. How do I sit, take take someone through the steps, and they're still in that place? The book says, remember, they are very ill. But they're still romanticizing it. No matter how banged up they are, they're still romanticizing about the good old days. And every time I talk to them, they're talking about drinking and bar stories and liquor and, and the escapades. If I'm not spiritually fit, I'm listening awfully close. So tell me more. Rather, I don't care about that. I care about getting well. You see what goes on? This is, working with others and the 12-step call, that action, is a huge responsibility. And a tremendous amount of power that we get if we're spiritually fit to go do that stuff. Huh? Just a couple more things, if I can find them. The families, and if there's any Al-Anons in here, I bless you for your glorious fellowship as well. What about the families? See, our our job is to be a maximum service to others. Now, I was on the receiving end growing up of an active alcoholic and and an addict. Uh, So I lived, uh, I can tell you personal experiences, what it's like 
praying and hoping that the Alki mom gets sober. And riding that vicious cycle, because you ride, we ride right with them. The thing is, we get medicated and they don't. Right? So I know what that's like. And now I'm on this side being the recovered alcoholic. And I'm in the treatment center business, so I, I talk to families all the time. I'm an alcoholic. I talk to families all the time. And I see what they go through. And because I come work with you, it doesn't mean I have to necessarily neglect the family, your family. I offer them this way of life. I point them to Al-Anon. I listen to what they have to say. And beyond that, when I'm sponsoring someone, and every all the men I've sponsored can, will tell you this, that the families are of great importance to their recovery. It isn't about coming here, getting sober, and forgetting the family. I was sponsoring a guy. He had about 15 minutes sober, and he was cured. And um, so we met in a meeting. We were in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, and he came down with his wife. Now, I'm, he's really new, new, new sober. And he came down, and he walked towards me, and he left her in the middle of the room. It's called the Alpine Group in Brooklyn. And uh, he came up to me. He, I said, what's wrong? He says, she's really sick. She needs help. <laughs> you got sober 20 minutes ago. What are you talking about? Right? Yeah, she is sick. Because our book says years of living with an alcoholic will make any wife or child neurotic. The whole family, to some extent, is ill. Why? Because of us. But I've heard too many times in AA, when we get sober and we get with a sponsor, we get around our fellowship, that the family's left behind holding the bag. And when we sponsor people, whether it's through a 12-step call, they just come to us at our meetings and we sponsor people and they get this and they start to wake up, shouldn't they be taking this home and bringing healing to the family and inviting their families into our open meetings and our group anniversaries so we don't have this secret life? I hear it all the time. You know, my wife is uh, annoyed. I go to these meetings. I say, did you ever take it to an meeting? No, why not? We have open meetings. We have anniversaries. Take her to an Allen on me. I don't go there. Now you do. <laughs> right? We have double winners in AA. Can you take my wife to a meeting? Right? Can you take my husband to one of your Allen on meetings? They're in, they're in our fellowship, the double winners. So we take these principles where? Homes, occupations, and affairs. It doesn't say affairs, then home. Home, occupation, and affairs. Our book tells us that. Am I taking this home? Am I supporting the family? Am I understanding uh, when I'm uh, uh, out and about in AA meetings and, and uh, the wife or the husband's feeling a little neglected that I shouldn't get angry with them? I've never been around and I'm not around again. And now I have all these other friends and I'm looking to take charge of everything again. Is it possible that I have something to do with that and I should offer support and say, what can I do? And maybe stay home one night. That's why this 90 and 90, maybe I need to stay home one night with the family and watch TV with my loved ones. You know, get goofy with the kids. Been drunk for a long time. What's goofier? Right? Take the kids to a ball game. Take the, have date night with the wife or the husband. Took me a long time to get that one. Date night. Go out for dinner. Go watch a movie. Sometimes, you know what I found, um, practicing these principles is not that difficult because sometimes my significant other just wants me in the house. You know, maybe they're down on a computer doing banking and stuff and I'm upstairs watching a game, but it's okay. I'm in the house. We're around. That's huge. But we do, we get, I got to make meetings, got to make a meeting, got to go to a meeting, another meeting, go another meeting, got the 9 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock. Right? <laughs> and he or she's going, I don't want to get in the way because I don't want you to drink. And then just, you know, back the run, if I pull him away, he'll drink. If I don't, you know, what do I do? They shouldn't have to be burdened with that. Who's your sponsor? That's what I want to know. See, I, 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 I've caught, I've caught grief for this. I throw every, I was in Canada one time and I was making a statement to, over, over coffee. I go looking for the sponsor. 
oh, you can't blame the sponsor because it's the prospect's fault. Then why is he sponsoring him for? You do what I ask you to do or find someone else. It's that simple. Why are you allowing this type of behavior if you're really the sponsor? So I point to the sponsor. A sick prospect, I'm looking at the sponsor. Sick group, I'm looking at the, the, the bleeding deacons or the elder statesman who's ever in charge. Hmm? They only know what they know. So the men I sponsor uh, um, go home and try to make it right and be practice love and tolerance with their loved ones. That's part of sponsorship. It's not only about being an AA and being a good AA. It's being responsible wherever we go. The way we would go in the middle, Chris talked about it. Okay, I'm on my way at 2 o'clock in the morning to go get a drunk. What about the, when the kids or the wife or the husband's not feeling too good and you have to get to a meeting? Sponsor? My wife's not feeling well. I think I should be home. Sponsors on his game say, yeah, you go take your wife tonight. We'll be fine. And you get home. You make a little tea, spend some time healing. Dependable, reliable, responsible, we're sober, we're awake, we're doing what God wants us to do. Not like, sorry, honey, you and the flu are on your own. <laughs> Joe celebrating 90 days. I have to be there. <laughs> <All> right. <clears throat> Lord have mercy. Um, so uh, when I was first getting sober, um, I was knocking out lots of meetings. I love our fellowship. And there was a guy who's gone home to Ghana. I can use his last name because he did. A guy named Jim Laffey from Brooklyn. The guy, the word on this guy was, spend 10 minutes with Jim Laffey. You don't need a meeting for a year. This guy oozed God. One of the giants back in Brooklyn. And he pulled me, he was a tough guy, and he pulled me aside, smoked a cigarette right down to the end, tough Irish guy. And he says, when do you go home? Is what he means. He says, when do you spend time with the bride, is how he said it. I was married at the time. I said, Jim, I'm making meetings. You need date night. You need to go home and take care of the bride. And he, he'd look at you, eyeball, I remind my dad, Irish version of my dad, Eyeball, eyeball, if you flinched, you were lying. <laughs> don't blink, don't even look this way because it's over. Right? You know those guys. Right? <clears throat> My dad, if he talks to you, he's eyeballing you, don't even blink, you're a liar. You know. So um, that's what he did, and I didn't do it. And it was a couple of weeks later, I ran to Jimmy again, and we were outside the Bay Ridge group. And um, he asked me the same questions, and he I, he didn't get in my face, but he did it out of compassion and, and love, and he kind of laid it down for me. And um, I started date night way back when. Yeah. And I started spending more time, and it was okay to stay home a night here and a night there and, and do goofy stuff. Right? And I do that now in my relationship. Right? I'm home. Wednesday nights, uh, unless I, if I get asked to give a talk on a Wednesday, I get, uh, I just run it by my sponsor because we talk on Wednesday nights. My sponsor and I talk on Wednesday nights. We share, him, I share inventory with them. I just let them know, hey, Joe, listen, uh, I got a talk to do. I don't want to break our commitment. We, we go with this. Off you go. And the rest of the night, I'm home on Wednesday, hanging around. And I travel a lot on weekends. So very often I'm home on weekends if I'm not traveling. Lots of times, I'm at the airport Friday morning, get back Sunday afternoon, Sunday night. So if I'm not traveling, I, you'll find me home down the shore in my backyard on the weekend. I'm home. Calls come in, talk to a few guys, but I'm home. I'm around the house doing stuff. Then I hit the road the rest of the week. This is because of good sponsorship, great teachers. I, 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 I love the, 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 the words for teacher and student. I teach but always in the spirit of a student with a beginner's mind. you know, And trying to give back to the family, give back to my home group, give back to AA, give it all away because it always comes back and gives me more. can't ever pay back Alcoholics Anonymous. How do you do that? You can't. How do I pay back a glorious fellowship like that that has given me God and dignity and sobriety? How could I do that? How could I do that? Every time I walk into a meeting, there's a hello, welcome. I've been from meetings from here to Timbuktu, welcome. Yeah. What a thing we belong to. Lord have mercy. What a thing we belong to. Right? 
And I pray I never take it for granted. And I pray I always stay teachable and give it back with the same love and gratitude that's freely given to me. No matter where I go in Alcoholics Anonymous, welcome. That's all I got. Peace. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.